Father, in the name of Jesus, we are grateful to you. You are the one who made us, who created all things. You are the one who will always have preeminence in our lives. Help us to recognize that you are there with us at all times, even when we don't feel like, even when we don't feel your presence, even when it seems like you are far away, even when our emotions deceive us, that you are there because it is a promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We depend on your word more than our eyesight. We depend on your word more than our situations or circumstances. And so we ask that the word that you minister to us will not be stolen by the enemy, will not be choked by our associations, will not fall on a stony heart that refuses to bow to the Lord, that it will come in the fourth soil where there will be the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit of the living God in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, please turn to St. Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. The account that I'm going to read is also recorded in Luke chapter 18, from verse 18 to 30. It's also recorded in Mark chapter 10, from verse 17 to 31. But I'm going to take it from Matthew chapter 19, from verse 16. Matthew chapter 19, coming from verse 16. I'm reading from the King James Version. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples said it, they, ex they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible.
possible. The account begins with a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. He has a question. He didn't know what the answer would be. There is no record to show that he got rich fraudulently or he stole from someone. He must have worked hard, pushed the levers, pressed the buttons, stay up and toil, and acquire riches and amass his riches. By the sound of it, he could have been financially free. There is also no record that his riches were ill-gotten or he was an ardent sinner. If I can interject for a moment, the position that he was is the message that a lot of people preach for many to become. It is very easy to espouse the doctrine that wealth, physical wealth, reflects your godliness, but it doesn't always turn out that way. There are people that are poor who love the Lord. There are also people that are rich who love the Lord. When you hear the word rich man, it might sound to you like someone far from you. Someone that is just swimming in finances, in luxury, having a lifestyle that is just so opulent, something to be desired. But let me submit to you that you are rich. You see, being rich depends on who you compare yourself to. When you look at a person richer than you, you feel you are poor and they are rich. But there are many people who can look at you and they feel you are rich and they are poor because you are of a higher standard than where they are. So this becomes a variable that sometimes is misunderstood by many people. If you reach a millionaire, he will tell you that he's not rich because he's looking forward to be a billionaire. There is always something to look forward to. This young man must have had it made. If you go to some places, which is the reason why it is difficult for some to preach to people that are wealthy. Because if you say to a person, if you come to Jesus, he will give you A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the person already has A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Your message is gone. Because he has no reason to come to your Jesus. You cannot tell a wealthy man that owns seven cars. That if you come to Jesus, he will give you a car. He already has seven of them. So if, if you want to throw a bait out there to attract a person to God. And your bait just simply is what God will give you. You're taking a chance that they may already have what you are saying. And so in the kingdom of God... The ground is leveled between those that are physically rich and those that are poor. Because no matter how rich or poor you are, you both have a need for one thing that is common to all. And that is a need for God. So the poor person cannot relax and say, oh, I thank God I'm so poor. I must be going to heaven because it is just the rich people that it's difficult for them with all their riches. The riches in terms of this scripture, you will soon find out, become the things that entrap us, becomes the things that possess us, becomes the thing that we look at as a dependency, what we can lean on. Riches is not only finances or physical wealth or furniture or all kinds of things that you can see. He went to Jesus. He says, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you have to understand that it is the intention of a rich man to continue to be rich, to continue with the good side of life. It reminds me of a man that was so wealthy that he put in his will that if he dies, he should be buried inside his expensive car so that he will have something to drive in the next life. This, is, this was his own mindset because he perceived that all his enjoyment cannot possibly end. There must be a way to continue it. So you can picture this rich young ruler going to Jesus. To have eternal life it will be basically to ask, how can I keep things going the way they are? 
How can I make my good life last forever? How can I have my enjoyment continue endlessly? He wants to know that. And every indication shows that he was religious as well. Because he was not shocked at Jesus' answer at first. Jesus has an answer for him. He said to him at first, Why do you call me good? Knowing that there is none good except God. Uh, why would Jesus ask such a question? One would perhaps look at the annals of human life. And see sometimes when people want to get things and want to persuade you, they will tell you first how good and promote you. You would understand the reason why typically like myself. If a person wants to sell insurance to me, he might not use the same strategy as selling to other people. The person might come with words like, you know, Pastor Mike, you know that God is good. You know that the Lord is so great. He is just worthy of all our praise and he wants us insured. I want you to know that in so doing, he gets my attention undeniably because he begins with talking about what way I am. And now he uses way I am to introduce what he wants to sell. And so Jesus is asking, why do you call me good? Basically, I would say there must be a reason why you're buttering me up. There are some people that you just know when they begin to talk so good about you that it is because there is another objective. And so here Jesus said there is none good except God. He draws his attention to God immediately. Not because Jesus himself was not God, but he challenges his mindset to understand that only God is good. Therefore, he has God to deal with, not God to butter up. He says to him, thou knowest the commandments. He says, you know the commandments. He begins to list to him several of the commandments. Notice here that Jesus does not quote for him the exact words of all the Ten Commandments. Why is that? Because Jesus knows that if you break one, you've broken all. He doesn't have to quote all of it. The commandments were given not to save us, but to reveal God's holy standards. And one of them represents all of them because it's just the same spirit manifesting in different ways. When he told him some of the commandments, he didn't take advantage of it and say things like, oh, well, thank you, I'm glad I don't have to keep the rest. Something touched his heart. And he, 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 he said to Jesus, I have kept all of that since I was small. I have done what the scripture, what the law of Moses says. That's why you can surmise that this is a religious man. When Jesus heard these things, he said to this rich young ruler, he says, you are missing one thing. One thing. He must have been looking to Jesus like, what could it be? I have all of these in my CV already. And he said, there's one missing. Jesus says something now to him. And if you pay attention to what Jesus says, Jesus is not listing one of the commandments. He is saying something that represents the spirit of the commandment, which was the whole reason why the children of Israel missed out because while they strive for the physical law, they were constantly breaking the spiritual law, which is the root of the physical speech or what is written physically for them to see. He says to him, Sell, go and sell all what you have and distribute unto the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Go and sell all what you have. Think about this for a moment. He was so used to what he had that the whole idea of having to part with it was almost suicidal. That is why I say there are things like this young ruler that is in our lives. 
that if we were told to do that, uh, we would be scratching our head and walking away in sorrow. Go and sell is the first commandment, but what follows next is almost devastating for him. He doesn't sell and put it in his bank account. He doesn't sell it and, and diversify his business or portfolio. In fact, he doesn't sell it and keep for himself. He sells it first, which is working to sell it. And then after he derives the proceeds from the sale, it still, he takes it and is supposed to give it away to the poor. Now, this, the steps here are kind of curious because one, it belonged to him. Secondly, the poor didn't have anything to do with how he got what he had. Thirdly, he didn't owe them as if to pay back. Fourthly, if he is going to give to the poor, that will basically mean that the poor will become rich and he will become poor. Now, if you, if you see how Jesus is painting a picture of himself, who became poor that we may become rich, who died on the cross and was sacrificed in open shame, that we who were once afar off from God may be drawn nigh by his blood to become the children of God. He didn't amass all things to himself, and say it's all mine I'll sit on it I'll increase it he gave up he gave up his throne he walked away he came to die and emptied himself of all that he could claim is his because if Jesus could say the whole world is mine he had the right to say it he is the one by according to the word of God by him all things were created he came and he came in the form of human flesh that he was the Lord God Almighty. For unto us a child is born, the prophet Isaiah said, a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the Lord Jesus. And the word of God says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. So he had no need that he then emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and died on the cross for our sins, making us rich by emptying himself to a place that we could say a place of poverty. The reason why Jesus would say this to this man is to also highlight is it the same spirit that is in me that is in you do you have commonality with me as god manifested in the flesh your religious quotations and all the bible passages you know your long prayers and your song in the choir all of the regulations the do's and don'ts of your church denomination when you finish all of that do you have the spirit of god the who will be able to use you wherever whenever whatever he desires to do in your life and so there is a small challenge here because it certainly now it moves from the place of how many commandments you know and keep to the place of locating yourself as an integral part of the body of christ where your identity can be spirit based not quotation based not religious externals but who you are on the inside i believe that each person basically know who they are on the inside in a to a certain degree and the certain things that we may be ashamed of concerning who we really are and we try to deflect from that and find ways to not allow our mind to stay too long on the truth of about ourselves that we may not be comfortable with and so jesus is not trying to embarrass him jesus is trying to present to him just in a very gentle way he leads him on and he tells him about this commandment for which he responds he is keeping all of them he moves now to the identity of the man to bring out what is inside of him he said go and sell it give the proceeds to the poor all of a sudden jesus has touched his dependency jesus has touched what his life was about jesus has touched like he touched
churches people who sing at church because of something they have people who pray because of something they have people who preach because of something they have people who are quick to point out and tell other people you know if you follow Jesus you will be as rich as myself if you have my type of faith you will scale the mountains in your life whereas they do not understand that there are people that have more than your type of faith and they are going through stuff that you wouldn't even believe if they tell you they are dealing with situations that do not look like they are victorious because the evidence in the physical places them in a place that they cannot be able to answer for themselves why am i in the state that i am i tend to do all what the bible says i pray i sing i read the scripture i study i try to do god's will but for some reason i am stuck in some situation or a certain case that i'm not able to free myself from what is it that is missing jesus led him slowly he wants him to absorb, absorb, and come to that place. Give to the poor. Sell all what you have. This is what Jesus says to him. He says, you will have treasure in heaven. He didn't jump for joy and say, Lord, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm happy to give up all I have for the treasures of heaven. It did not move him. It tells you immediately. This man had religion and did not have heaven in mind. Heaven, according to some people's understanding, is something circumstantial that can happen if you believe you are basically good. But we forget that the standards of God and the standards of man are totally different. Yes, God is merciful. But God is not so merciful that he will give his throne to Satan. God is not so merciful that he will make heaven become what the earth looks like. God is not so merciful that he will leave for each person what righteousness should mean. That if you define it that way, you, you can count me in. God has a standard by which he challenges each person. For you, it may be some other challenge, some other exam that God gives in your life for you to answer that question. For another person, it may be something totally different. The way that God proves who you are is by different standards, different ways than what he does with other people. In other words, if I can put it this way, he gives an exam for many people, different people, and if you want to copy the answers of another person, you discover that the test that the person is taking was different from the one you were given. And so you have to answer your own test. This man was young, he was a ruler, and he was rich. It's all in place. Seemingly, the question is, how much do I have to give up in order to gain the kingdom of God? According to this experience, he had to surrender all. And he had to surrender it so that he can come to the place where his life can become faith-based, not work-based. Where his life can become heaven-bound, not in confusion. And there are many people that would pray to God to bring them to where this man was. In fact, many people that fast and pray for a breakthrough, they're not asking to be super rich. They're just asking for a little bit more. God, if you will just add a little bit more, if you will just increase my this and my that. But look at this man. All of the increase that he had, it seems like he is challenged. He is to give it all up. This man was not the only one that was challenged like this. There's a man in the scripture called Abraham. God changed his name to Abraham. He promised him that his generation shall be as the sand of the sea. And yet, he and his wife, Sarai, who became Sarah, didn't have any child to talk about generation. And so here comes Isaac, his son. And listen to what God says. Take that your son, your only son, the son of your old age. You're 99, your wife is 89. There is perhaps, medically speaking, no hope that anything more will happen. And so take that your son go and sacrifice for me 
The Bible says Abraham got up early in the morning. Grabbed his son Isaac, we are going. He says to his son, we are going to worship the Lord. I don't know what worship means these days. These days, sometimes worship means three fast songs and two slow songs and the pastor's eulogy and then the benediction. I don't know. I don't know what it means to some people. But when Abraham was going to worship God, he didn't need a choir. He didn't need a pat on the back. He didn't need for people to say, oh, man of God, you are so wonderful. He told his son, we are going to worship. He took his son to Mount Moriah to worship. And that worship meant he was going to sacrifice all that he had to continue his posterity. He was his only son, not one of his sons. Incidentally, he had the willingness to do it not because he wanted to be a murderer, but because God said so. He raised the knife to stab and kill his son and God says, hold off. And God said to him, look in the thicket. There is a lamb that has been provided as a substitute. He didn't have to. But then he added something else. He said, now I know that you really love me. Because you didn't even withhold your son. You were willing to sacrifice your only son. Two things concerning that event. Mount Moriah happens to be the exact mountain where Jesus died on the cross. And so Abraham was used by God to show a picture. To typify Christ. How it is that God gave his only begotten son. That whosoever will believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But he did not know that at that time. How much is a person willing to give up in order to gain eternal life? Whatever God says. Because that's all what it takes. Nothing more. Nothing less. The man heard from Jesus. In fact, there was a promise. He said you will have treasure in heaven which means it is an assurance that he was going to be in heaven because he was not going to have a treasure at a place where he is absent here jesus has given him all all that he needed you see it means that everything that the man owned was not going to take him to heaven what he was was not going to take him to heaven good thing he asked jesus that question like some people said tell me the truth i won't get upset but he did get upset when he was told the truth what would have happened if this man had asked a pastor a minister a christian today you know i have uh, several rolls royces and uh, three of my 15 aircraft are, are in for servicing and uh, my mansions uh, I cannot even count and I have my new mansion that is set up with the Olympic size swimming pool upstairs and um, I'm just you know I'm just relaxing and um, what do you think I uh, uh, pastor that I can do to have eternal life you know what some people will say today? They say, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you asked me. If you can tithe to my church, I'll strongly recommend to Jesus that he makes sure to write your name in the book of life. If, uh, if you can make a big whopping donation I'll send you my account details. If you join my church, it's a short ticket to glory. What would an average person say today? You know, I'm so happy, sir, that you have made this wise question. And I think we are kingdom partners. I bring the spirit, you bring the money. And uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, spiritual cooperation. But Jesus didn't look for what to extract from him. 
Jesus told him, look beyond yourself. First, secondly, divorce yourself from what has possessed you. Thirdly, do not conflict physical wealth with eternal life or your standing with God. It's very easy for people that serve God and don't have so much to be laughed at because some person is quick to tell you if you were serving the true God, your bank account will be so full, the bank will be asking you to take some out to leave space for others. If you were a child of the living God, you wouldn't have any pain in your body because it, it just doesn't belong. If you really know Jehovah, you would not encounter any problem at all. In fact, your life will be like a bed of roses. Even the footsteps that you take, by the time you lift up your feet, it will be like they sprinkle some roses for your next step to land on. So the whole thought of going through difficult times is foreign to some preaching. Hence, many pastors will say things like, give your life to Jesus because you might die tomorrow. And if you do, all your problems will be over if you give your life to Jesus. Two things happen. The person came to Jesus and said, yes, I give my life to Jesus. One, they didn't die tomorrow. Secondly, they had problems after that. And so somebody lied to them. Did not tell them the truth. That it is not the absence of problems. It is the presence of God who helps you to overcome them. Because we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. This man wanted to enter into eternal life. He loved it. He wanted life to continue. What was the problem then? He wanted it to continue his way. And so Jesus is telling him God's way. He had a decision to make. He could have said, Lord, if it is painful what you're saying, then if that's what it takes, I'm willing. Count me in. He could have said, Lord, I'll follow you. But do I have to give up all that? He didn't say that. He could have said, Lord, <laughs> my pastor didn't tell me all this. But I'm so happy I met you in person and you've explained to me the ABCs of eternal life. Thank you so much. I'm in. He didn't say that. This is what happened. When the young man heard what Jesus said, he went away. Number one, what was his attitude? Sorrowful. Number two, and what was the reason? He had great possessions. He wanted not to part with what was critical to him, even if that is what he needs to do to get his life right with God. Let's ask ourselves a few questions. What if it was you? What if it was you? My God adds, he doesn't subtract. If God can add to what I have, then I can follow him because you see, it is easy to testify about the goodness of God when I have the Louis Vuitton handbag. It is easy for me to shout hallelujah when I'm wearing a snake skin shoes or shoes from some skin of a reptile somewhere. It is very easy for me to tell people how good God is when I have an unbreakable bank balance. It is so easy for me to tell people that my God reigneth when all my bills are overpaid. It makes it easier for me to say that and my life becomes
becomes then a testimony if I can just point people to some physical stuff that is just swallowing me up and I'm just swimming in this sea of wealth and I can say I save a big God who has made me big and I can tell people if you want to be big like me you come to my big God but many times it's not like that many times I tell you it's a struggle many times it's full of thorns and difficulties many times it's not you're not surrounded by people who pamper you with all the love you think you should have in fact you suddenly discover that the closer you got to God the more you seem to draw these enemies into your path. People that you didn't know who they were before, all of a sudden, they used to smile at you when you were almost like them, lukewarm. But now you got closer to God and suddenly it begins to depreciate. All of those smiles receive some negative transformation. They are no longer the warm people that you know and you begin to look at yourself and ask yourself did I do something wrong? How come this and that and that is happening? It is called a test. It is is called a challenge but what for it is designed to show who you really are to separate you from what you have and ask you a question who are you without those things in the case of this man he was nothing he was nobody and he made a decision he was not going to follow Jesus not only he wasn't going to follow Jesus he basically by his action and his body language and his decision, he seems to say, I've had enough of your preaching. I thought you had something useful to say. I'm here to enjoy my wealth. And I'm just asking you, I didn't ask you anything about my money. I asked you about how I can live forever. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you are attacking me. It's an attack on my wealth. You touch something that is dear to me. You've touched me now. You should just preach about life, not my wealth. These are two separate things. And Jesus said, no, it is all about who you are. The question can be asked, who are you? Who would you be if God were to subtract those comfort zones and subtract those dependencies? What will be left of you? I'm not saying God should. Because if you look at the life of Abraham, he was blessed, he was wealthy. The Bible mentions the splendor of his cattle and everything that he owned. But do not get fooled. Abraham was not rich so that he might be advertised. Abraham was rich because he had responsibilities. Go and see the responsibilities that Abraham had. You will discover that his wealth was to sustain his ability to fulfill the responsibilities that God gave him. And secondly, he was of a spirit that was willing at any time. If Abraham could sacrifice his only son Isaac, there is none of those cattle. If God said, give up all that cattle, it would mean nothing to him. Do you have that kind of a heart? Do you have that kind of a spirit? God is the one with the key to eternal life. Do you have that? Do you have that kind of a heart? Or do you have the heart of this man? That if God were to touch, put his hand on that one thing that has preoccupied you, that is not of God, and says, give up all that and follow me. How easy would that be? The Bible says the man was sorrowful. He was sad. His stomach dropped. His countenance dropped. He felt very bad. Why would he feel bad? Because that's not what he expected. He was disappointed in what Jesus said. He wanted none of that. If that is what it took for him to have eternal life, he might as well walk away from it. What will be the end of this man? If judgment shall first begin in the church, what shall be the end of those that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ? Could you stand, please? There are some hard choices that we must make. For everybody, it is different. And it has nothing to do with what people think or say. 
it has everything to do with what God requires of you. Don't be like this man. When God touches you in that sensitive place, don't get sorrowful and walk away. Don't walk away from Jesus. Walk to him and he will perfect you in every way in your life. Father, we thank you. We bless you.